I saw a, a John Cleese uh, interview, a lecture on YouTube on the creative process, and it, I thought it was a Monty great... Monty Python actor, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's a comedian. He said there's the open mind and there's the closed mind. And when you create music, you go into this open mind where there's no wrong answers. You can do whatever you want. You're just playing with an idea like the way a little kid would play with a, a bug, you know, on, <laughs> on the playground. You're yeah. just like, huh. What happens if it goes backwards or I, what if this chord is underneath it or maybe if it goes this way or that way and you're just playing with it you're not really trying to accomplish anything he said the most creative people can stay in the open mind the longest where they don't really know what they're doing so they get comfortable with not knowing what they're doing and they're okay with the discomfort of not knowing where things are going and he says you know, you're in the open mind and you're just trying different things and then once you find something you like you go into the closed mind and you, you do it, now you develop it, you, you work on that one idea. And then at a certain point, you're like, let me just step back now, go back into the open mind and just kind of assess what I just did. Maybe it's a week later or something, or maybe it's later that same day. And then you're going back and forth. You're in the open mind, you're in the closed mind where you're actually developing. And that, that's what I try to do with each piece I write. I always tell myself at the beginning, I don't need to accomplish finding the idea today. Because I have all week to just keep trying to find mm -hmm. new ideas, you know. I'm just taking the pressure off myself because it's so much weight on your back, you know. I'm like, I yeah, need to absolutely. find that thing, you know, and I have to find that thing. Every once in a while, a student will be like, I'm going to play your piece on my senior recital, and they need a hard copy and with your signature on it or something, you know. So yeah. then I have to, like, up the, up the price because it's going to take me a while to, to do all that, you know. So you do do all that stuff yourself, the yeah. printing and the, yeah. wow. But uh, it's not it's not that much. I, I hardly ever have to do that, it seems, anymore. But I remember those days of, like, just every piece I wrote, I went and got several copies printed. I would go to the local place, the Kinko's or whatever, and then just mail them out to people, you know. <laughs> American Composers Forum had, like, a list of all the ensembles, you know, in, in America. Like, hey, well, I have a string quartet. I'm going to send it to all the string quartets. Oh, did you really do that? I would do that. You would print out the, the yeah. score and send it out? Yeah, but nothing would ever happen. <laughs> nothing would ever come of it, you know, because it's like they don't know who I am. It's just... That's expensive, too. And it was. And, and labor intensive. It was, yeah. So so getting to YouTube, I mean, it was like, click, you know. Here, here's, it kind of made sense. Here's the link, you know. Yeah, because you have this YouTube channel. I, I think it's just your name, right? David Bennett yep. Thomas, right? Yeah. And you start, when did you start it? Now, quick pit stop to let you know that I do offer one-on-one -on -one consultations and lessons in regards to anything composition related. This can range for helping you put together your portfolio for any composition degree that you're applying to, or you might want to improve your creative chops as a composer from week to week or month to month, or you might want to get a better handle of the behind the scenes of what it's like to be a composer. How do you sell your sheet music? How do you negotiate commission rates? How do you apply to contests? How do you apply to grants? How do you do anything as a composer, let alone just writing the music? So if this is you, you can contact me using the link down in the description below. So I started that, I was on a flight back from South America. My university was, we were going down there to work with students in Santiago, Chile. And it's an overnight flight. And somehow I figured out how to use iMovie. And every semester, you know, I made my students learn a Moonlight Sonata and Pathetique Sonata and know, know what key they're in and what the Roman numerals and the functional harmony is and stuff. And I thought, you know, every semester I have to share the PDF with the whole class for them to study from. What if I just made a YouTube video of that? Maybe I had a few videos up already before that. Um, but that was kind of like the, the first little breakthrough. I was like, oh, people are watching this, you know? Like it's hard to find... At that point, particularly, you couldn't just go on YouTube and find a nice clean video that just mm -hmm. had everything labeled, you know? So I just made that and people started watching it, you know? And it's like, oh, hmm. <laughs> so you made it public, not just for your students, but you made it public for yeah. everybody. And then you realized, oh, not, it's not just my students watching this thing, it's a bunch mm -hmm. of other people I don't know. Yeah. yeah, and it felt like this is something I could just kind of share with the music community. And it's almost like they're taking the class a little bit or they're getting a little bit of what happens in the class. They can sort of see what's happening. And so a lot of people started watching those. And then I was like, well, I can kind of pepper in my own music sort of in the midst of all that. So I'm trying to remember what made me think to put it up on YouTube. I don't really remember. Other than like, yeah. I, don't, I don't really feel like always having to post this into the, the class um, 
I forget what it was even called, canvas, whatever the canvas equivalent At that time. At that time, whatever the thing was. So people started watching those. I'd have have to go back and look at the whole genealogy of, you know, when I did what. But then when I would get a performance of one of my own pieces, I'd be like, oh, I could put that up too. And then the fear was, are people going to just screenshot this piece and not buy it, you know? Ah, okay. You thought of it that way. Yeah. That's interesting. I never thought about people screenshotting. and With a solo piece. Like the one that's been watched the most is a solo bass clarinet piece. Somebody asked me to write a bass clarinet piece for a um, memorial concert that was in London. And I wrote a piece that was called Pause, P-A-W-S. And it was for my friend Carla Rees, who was a flutist, who there was these London riots and all these houses burned down and her two cats were, were they died in this house fire. So it was a piece in memory of her cats and in honor of her for a, like a fundraiser for her basically. And Sarah Watts, who's an amazing bass clarinetist, asked me to write a piece. So I just wrote it, and then that one really kind of took off. Of all my pieces, that's the one that has you know the most views on it. And almost every week, somebody says, "I want to play your piece." You know, that's awesome. Yeah, and is you, that the piece called Edifice? No, that's called or Pause. Okay. And then you know, some players have made their own videos of it and stuff. It's kind of like my piece that's most sort of like in the repertoire like people mm-hmm. know about that but it's a piece for bass clarinet just solo bass clarinet solo bass clarinet okay well we have a piece for that, yeah. that you sent me earlier for bass clarinet and piano called edifice right so that, so it kind of is that kind of in the same ballpark language it sort of is yeah that one is again for sarah watts that was a piece that was fun to write another piece a lot of people have like asked to buy the score of and it was a fun one to compose because there was a whole theoretical thing happening. Usually when I compose, I don't have, I'm a jazz musician also, so I'm okay with just kind of going with my intuition. I don't really have like a real structural thing sort of yeah. always in, in mind. Well, you'd my, be surprised. People that are not from the jazz world too, they don't want to admit it, but they, they're also, they would into it also, that, that music. Let's hear a bit of it though. Okay. Let's hear a couple of minutes of this piece, Edifice for Bass, Clarinet, and Piano. Sure. Yeah, so that piece, um, I had this idea. Well, the whole piece kind of, D is sort of like the key of the piece, but I I was messing around with the idea of like writing melodies that went from a minor second, then a major second, then a minor third, then a major third, it's sort of expanding intervals or contracting intervals. And um, then I started building chords out of that. What if I the, the intervals get smaller and smaller as they go up or you know, vice versa? And that's a piece that kind of, there's sort of like a, a concept behind it. There's like a theory behind how I put it together. And it just kind of goes throughout the whole piece. It was really a f- fun piece to write. And a lot of bass clarinetists and pianists would then send me emails and be like, well, what's going on in that piece? Because there's something, they can detect there's something, there's some way that it's put together. So then I tried to make a, 
like a mini lesson about that, you know, and uh, I did maybe four or five of these little composition mini lessons. They didn't really take off very well, so I didn't do any more of them. <laughs> That's a pretty cool idea, though. I mean, I kind of uh, looked at those. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to look at the yeah. whole video, but I kind of skimmed through it. And I'll have some of these videos down in the description below, too, if you want to check that out. But I just think it's I wonder also while I was watching some of these like educational videos that you had. Mm -hmm. Was there any pushback from your university that you teach? You teach in Philadelphia. Yeah, the University of the Arts. Was there ever any pushback from putting um, any of this like educational content that's like supposed to be reserved for your students, but you put it out in the world? Was that ever? Because nah. that's sometimes sometimes I think about because I teach this class at Columbia mm -hmm. called Music Humanities, which is mm -hmm. basically like a music history class. And I always thought, what if I just put my lessons, you know, edit mm -hmm. them together a little bit more nicely, but just put them out on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But then in the back of my mind, I thought, well, I don't know, like if anybody finds out that I did this, will right. will they be upset that I put that online, or yeah. is it is it not the same? Like I don't know, I don't know what you. I never you had any, about that, or have you ever thought about that? No, I mean I've thought about it, but I figured if, if anything, it would just make students interested, like, oh, I should check that school out. You know, mm. as a place, some of the stuff that's happening there. Yeah, so it's kind of I, I, nobody ever really said anything. You know that I shouldn't do it, so I just kept doing so it. You just keep doing it. Yeah, <laughs> if the, don't uh, if the, nobody don't says anything, boat. don't rock the boat. Yeah. yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, you've been doing it for a while, and I and I look up to that too because I, you know, to to be doing to be on YouTube for that long, you know, it's like I've been only on it for a couple of years, maybe, and maybe the last year has been serious, but mm -hmm. to do it seven, eight, nine, ten mm -hmm. years, and who knows what YouTube is like, you know, even right. a year from now. Yeah. So to kind of trust that process yeah. of putting content out and being vulnerable. I mean, it's, it's yeah. hard because we're not like trained to do that. We're not up on the camera. We don't like to right. be on stage and talk before right. our piece. Like we're yeah. just all of that. We're just trained yeah. to be alone back yeah. there and just, yeah. Well, this is the only time I've ever been on a camera. Really? Cause even the instructional the lessons, you know, I'm not, I don't show myself speaking. <laughs> oh, right. This is so you're, this is your, the face reveal, <laughs> but I don't have like, um, that's funny. I didn't think about that. Yeah. I don't have any of the equipment. I mean, I, I just do, I do what I'm able to do and whatever happens happens, but pretty much everything that has happened for getting performances and commissions and all that has all been through, you people finding me on YouTube. I mean, really, almost. All. I mean, even like getting to wow. go to Israel for a week and be a composer in residence there. Somebody heard my Omaya oh Mysterium video and loved it and wanted to. So everything has been through, yeah, through YouTube. Just people seeing things there. It seems like and and sharing things through through there. That's amazing. I I wouldn't have see for me. It's the complete opposite. I had sign up. I mean, I still have a career outside of this i didn't have to do any of this right to have my music because my music was getting played and all that stuff yeah but i felt like i needed something more like it wasn't enough in terms of like create creatively speaking because you know you write a piece for three four five months yeah. maybe it took a year or two to get that commission in the first place yeah and it's just like a slog yeah. and then it's done and then you gotta do it again or maybe there's other projects in the backlog yeah and there's nothing that's like immediately um gratifying right so when i do a show like this uh, you know afterwards i feel really good about it you know yeah. usually if it went well <laughs> yeah yeah like this one is you know for yeah. example this is going to be uh, your best one this is the, this is the best <laughs> one sorry everybody else yeah right <laughs> and then i uh you know i go I, I usually go back there and i write and it's you know there's there's that adrenaline rush yeah of of it that you don't get when you're writing a piece for three four five months right and then hope to god that it's halfway decent yeah. So, I mean, that's my reason for it, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it used to be, so I'm 54. So when I was going to school, there wasn't actually internet yet, which is crazy to think. I mean, there was, I remember when somebody took me into the room and I'm going to show you the internet, you know, <laughs> and I was like, what is it, the internet? You know? And it's just like just Google and, you know, and I was really into Keith Jarrett and I had a roommate who was like, you can actually watch Keith Jarrett from a computer at home. I was like, what? Which makes me feel so old with them because it's crazy to imagine the world without it now. But back then, you know, I was sending scores out and making CDs, which are so expensive. I mean, you had to like get grant money and help from your school or whatever to, to make a CD. So everything was like hard copies. I still have boxes of CDs at home, you know. It's like, what do I do with all these CDs? So yeah, the YouTube thing was just kind of a no-brainer as, as a way to, to share the music. So a lot of those CDs are on Spotify 
but not very much happens with it, with that. So I, I just feel like, you know, I'm just going to put everything I can up on YouTube and just kind of make it a place where there's just lots of music. I think of the, my channel as like a place just to go for a student to go and just get ideas of mm -hmm. like, you know, here's what quartal harmony sounds like. Here's what quintal harmony sounds like. Here's what, here's a, a Webern piece. Like I, I couldn't find on YouTube just a real clean analysis of a row count like through a, a, a you know, a Webern or a 12. Oh yeah. Piece. So you just, you just feel made one. the need. Yeah. yeah it's so just you like, wanted to see it. I wanted so to see make it. it. Yeah. It's like a five minute video. And I mean, I use it every year with my, my classes so they can just see. You know, here, here's how the line goes from the soprano down to the piano and back up here, and they, they can see it. To me, that that's a good thing, you know, for students to it's be able to see it. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, speaking of, you were mentioning Keith Jarrett before, and I mean, you have a jazz background, which we didn't really get into, but I want to show an excerpt of one of these pieces that you did with the kind of a jazz oh, yeah. influence, because it's so different. Like when I heard the bass yeah. clarinet piece that we just heard, yeah. and then I heard this also, well, this is by the same guy. So yeah. I want to kind of explore that. So this is the, uh, this is the piece... Uh, called, uh, and it has a fun title too, You Can Dance If You Want To, and I'm going to play the habanera, the first movement. Sure. You know, I mean, the reason I wanted to play this piece, too, because I feel like I don't know what it's like from your generation of composers, because at least from the stories that I've heard, you know, there is like this aesthetic. You got to be in a certain aesthetic mold and that's it, you mm -hmm. know, and that's the way it is. But you have these pieces where, you know, it's almost like you can't tell it was you, except mm. for the fact that they all are very well, like tightly. Uh, mm. But you can tell like that thing that you said before where they asked you, hey, how is it put together? I can hear something, mm. but I don't know what it is. I mean, this piece has that too. Mm -hmm. But how how is it that you can go back and forth? Or it, does it feel like to you that you're going back and forth? Mm. Does it all feel like the same thing? For me, it all feels like it's kind of the same thing. It depends on what, you know, who I'm writing for also. So I teach traditional music theory classes and I teach jazz theory classes. And I love I love teaching theory. It's like my favorite thing um, and composing of course i can't um, say the same I, I i don't like teaching theory really <laughs> no <laughs> i love it and i feel like i get so many ideas when i'm teaching theory class so in that piece there are a lot of what we call slash chords like e over f you know triads over foreign bass notes and things like that and i was just teaching those that sort of harmony at the time i think when i wrote that piece and i said let me just try it myself and see what kind of sketches i can get from those pieces we were looking at in class. There's these Darius Mio piano pieces that have this kind of left-hand habanera kind of rhythms. Soldages do Brazil, I think. Oh, I didn't know that. So yeah. it has that kind of like, the don't, don't kind of yeah. thing in the back. Yeah, those are great. They're 12 pieces. <laughs> They're all polytonal. Most of them are polytonal. And the left hand is usually like a one chord to a five chord, but then the other hand's in a different key and playing and all these thing. real creative wow. stuff. <laughs> I have a video of analysis of one of those, you know, up there too on YouTube. So yeah, when I think of the sort of the concert music and the jazz music, I think I like the, the, the classical composers who have these other influences in their music. They have like some jazz th things in their music. I definitely like the jazz musicians who know about the classical world too. 
so to me, it all just kind of, it all kind of fits together. I, I don't, I don't have any like sort of internal conflict or anything going from one to the next. In fact, I would I like going from one thing to the next. You know, after I finish a a solo flute piece, I'd love to write a big band chart or something. You know, and just so there's no like there's no there's definitely no like um, you know divide at all, no chasm or anything in, in your <clears throat> thought. It's it's all kind of the same yeah. or whatever I feel like writing and that yeah. whatever the situation needs. Yeah, I'll go to that. Yeah. I mean, I have piano music that's a lot more dissonant, some of that, than the thing that, that we just played. So it kind of depends on who I'm writing for and what I'm, I guess what I'm digging into at the time also, as far mm -hmm. as my own listening goes. I definitely like writing jazz things where I'm bringing in some of the things that I know um, from the classical world. Mm -hmm. Like I have jazz pieces that are, people have said, that's almost like a Philip Glass kind of thing, you know? Oh, yeah? Yeah. There's one track called Driving Home Music, where at the end, there's all these pentatonic kind of washes that are happening. Like I'm playing in groups of seven and the bass player is phrasing in nine and guitar player is phrasing in three. And it's just like this minimalistic sort of wash. Then I tell the saxophonist, just play over it with whatever scale I give them or whatever. And that's taken directly from the beginning of um, the Ravel, the Mallarmé. Poems. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all that, that big pentatonic washy thing that just kind of happens at the beginning. But like when you take something like that, I mean, even someone that knows the repertoire, they don't think of that at yeah. first. Yeah, I had one person tell me like that one. reminded me of that Ravel piece, you know. <laughs> yeah, but then the other hundreds of people, thousands of yeah. people that heard it, they don't know. So it's yeah, uh, that's something I always tell my students. Like, there's no, um, there's no need to like reinvent the wheel with every piece. Right. Like it's too much pressure. Yeah. Like no one does that right. in any other art field. Why in um, composition, for whatever reason, there's this right. there's this pressure to come up with something new every time you you sit down. Right. I mean that that sounds like hell. Yeah. 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 A lot of composers. You know, I forget who it was that said it. Like I think Ned Roram said, every composer has about two ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like there's two. Some, if you're lucky, <laughs> two <laughs> ideas. You're lucky. Well, how do you start writing then? So, like, you, you're a jazz, I mean, you're a jazzer. I don't know which instrument you play. You play piano? Yeah, yeah. So is it something where you're, even when you're writing a quote-unquote classical piece, are you still kind of, like, improvising uh, those kind of things where you're talking about minor seconds getting, uh, or major seconds getting uh, more right. layered and things like this? Are yeah. you improvising? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I always start at the piano. I think it was Claude Debussy who said, when I compose, I think of all the music I know and I leave out what I don't like. <laughs> you know, so I just, okay. I think of all the music that I've spent so much time listening to and loving. And then I just, I try to just start with, a, you know, a blank slate and just improvise and, and try different things until something catches fire. I always tell my students, I don't always follow my own advice, but, you know, so week one of them writing a new piece, I come back next week with, at least five ideas, you know, like <laughs> every day, just start over and just come up with something, something new and, and see what you come up with. So I try to do that myself, you know, like this week, I'm just going to, no pressure on myself at all. I'm just going to sketch ideas with, and I'm just going to, I'm going to try to enjoy just not knowing what I'm doing, you know, and not knowing where this thing is going. Without knowing what uh, piece it's attached to, like no, or, 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 or no, I'm writing for a specific. Oh, okay, so player. it's still like a specific project, yeah. but you're not saying, okay, the first idea I come up with is, yeah. the, is the idea. Yeah, I saw a, a John Cleese uh, interview, a lecture on YouTube on the create creative process, and it, I thought it was a Monty great Python actor, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a comedian. He said there's the open mind and there's the closed mind, and when you create music. You know, you go in or create art, you go into this open mind where there's no wrong answers. You can do whatever you want. You're just playing with an idea like the way a little kid would play with a, a bug, you know, on, <laughs> on the playground. You're yeah. just like, huh, what happens if it goes backwards? Or, I, you know, I, what if this chord is underneath it? Or maybe if it goes this way or that way. And you're just playing with it. You're not really trying to accomplish anything. He said the most creative people can stay in the open mind the longest where they don't really know what they're doing. So they get comfortable with not knowing what they're doing. and They're okay with the discomfort of not knowing where things are going. And he says, you know, you're in the open mind and you're just trying different things. And then once you find something you like, you go into the closed mind and you, you do it. Now you develop it. You, you work on that one idea. And then at a certain point, you're like, let me just step back now go back into the open mind and just kind of assess what I just, what I did. Maybe it's a week later or something or 
Maybe it's later that same day. And then you're going back and forth. You're in the open mind, you're in the closed mind, where you're actually developing. And that, that's what I try to do with each piece I write. I mean, I try to, I always tell myself at the beginning, I don't need to accomplish finding the idea today because I have all week to just keep trying to find mm -hmm. new ideas. You know, I'm just taking the pressure off myself because it's so much weight on your back. You know, I'm like, I yeah, need to absolutely. find that thing, you know, and I have to find that thing. It has to be a masterpiece every time. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that open mind idea, I haven't heard it described that way. I actually, because I, I heard it described as the flow state, hmm. but the closed mind part of it you're talking about is something different, which I haven't heard of before. Yeah. I'll send you a link to his, uh, to that. I made it, I typed it all up and I make my students read it I, um, because it's, to me, it's a great composition lesson, you know, to not, to not feel like you have to come up with, you know, the big idea on this very morning, right, <laughs> you right. know? because it might take longer. Some things take longer as you get older and you look back at all, you know, all the pieces that you've written, some of them kind of rise to the top, you know, and some of them are like, well, I don't think I need to hear that one again. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's a reality for me. It's like, I have, I have a big folder of discarded pieces. That I just, so you actually discard pieces. I do. Cause I'm just like, I don't want anybody to play that. I'm not going to put that on my website. Yeah. Because if somebody asked for that score, I'd be like, oh, I really would want to make some tweaks to that. <laughs> you know, you have that urge. Yeah. Cause it's not, you know, it's like how I was hearing music at that point. It's maybe that piece I wrote, but it was on the way to the next piece. And so I don't regret writing it, you know, cause it, it helped that's me, my, that's my attitude. It helped me get to yeah. the next thing. Right now there's a choral piece that I wrote a couple of years ago. They're going to finally get to it because COVID just shut the whole thing down. And I went back to it just this week and I'm like, oh yeah, I need to change a couple things on this. It was a choir piece and I was, I was dividing the, the parts so much. I was trying to do too much, you know, and I'm like, you know, choir music is about melodies. It's not about always constantly having to divide and have all these different parts happening. Um, for this particular piece, it made sense. It's a fast piece. It made sense to clear out some things, and it sounds Was this better. the piece you sent me or a different piece? That's a different piece okay. so for that same choir. Well, let's hear the piece that you sent me because yeah. I really, really love this piece. So, again, this is different, but you can still have that, that thread of connectivity that you, you do in all your pieces. This is a piece called um, A Hymn to God the Father for Chorus, Piano, and Organ. And I have here 2022, is that correct? So it's just, yeah. just a written, fresh just, off the press. Just did that one. And um, the part I'm going to play is, so when you, what you're going to hear is not the choir. It's going to be this like duo of hmm. the, the organ with the celesta stop, doubled with the piano, right. and then it goes to the choral moment. Okay. So let's hear a couple minutes of that. I chose this part because I just thought, wow, I mean, who would have thought, you know, C, D, and E in the high register this is like the first three notes of a C major scale. And the way that it unfolds, it's so freaking simple. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, yeah, I, 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 I could have came up with that, right? Right. But no, it actually sounds, 
it sounds mm. really strong. Oh, I mean, thanks. it sounds powerful. And then when the choir comes in, I mean, it, it gives you like this, uh, the goosebump effect. Mm. So I thought that was really, uh, really awesome because I just didn't expect mm, just thanks. those three simple notes to, yeah, to, uh, give that kind of effect to me. Mm. And I feel like sometimes composers forget that some, like sometimes the simplest thing is the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wrote a piece for, for soprano with organ called Juliet. And I remember I went to the rehearsal in New York and when I was coming back, I thought my organ piece could be sight read by almost any organist, you know, like how many composers would just write a, a sight readable, <laughs> you know, it's like, but, but yeah. it was, I felt like it was the right thing to do. Like I wanted that pad, you know, of organ sound for her to sing over. So in this, I mean, I don't care if the organ is just playing one note, you know, if it's, if it's the yeah. right thing for what the, the piece is. So that organ, that choir piece was, um, you know, it was for a, a choir that's not music majors, you know, it's people who are like seminarians at the Princeton Seminary. So I had to like say, okay, I, I can't divide into eight parts, you know, it has to be the first beginning of it is just all the women singing in a unison line. And that can be really beautiful, you know, just a, a solo line yeah. can totally work. It's like the first time I wrote a big band chart and I had all four saxes play a unison line. It was like, oh, that's really nice. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so everything doesn't have to be, you know, 13th chords the whole time, you know. Uh, uh, that's something I, I'm i dealing with, too, in my stuff. Yeah. It's like, what can, how could I make, like, a unison, like a pure unison? And then how do I, like, slowly demorph that? Because yeah. in the repertoire, there's not really that many examples of, like, the orchestra, for example, doing a legitimately right. unison line. Yeah. You don't get that kind of texture unless you're listening to film music almost, where they're right. just kind of having, like, yeah. one straight-up thing. Because yeah. they're, 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 they're competing with so many other things in yeah. the, in the yeah. Uh, production. Yeah. So you've done film music. How, how did that end? A long time ago. I mean, Are you still interested in that? I love film music, but the the business of film music I'm not interested right. in because, you know, you do a film, and if you want to be in the industry, you kind of have to keep working on films. You can't just do a film and then stop for a year or two years and then work on another film. And right. you sort of have to have a team <clears throat> around you, otherwise you can go crazy. And I don't want to handle a team of people. Yeah. And if you really want to be in the business, you kind of have to start out as an assistant I didn't want to be an assistant. Yeah, so yeah. there was all these, like, there's all, there was all this friction from the very beginning that yeah. I didn't want to deal with that yeah. had nothing really to do with writing the music. Right. And I'm really glad that I didn't go that route because I, I don't think I would have experienced any of the things that I've done yeah. up to this point. Yeah. I mean, I, I made a lot less money <laughs> than I could have. Right. But I am really happy that I wrote these pieces that, that got me to where I am now. And I'm yeah. happy that I went to Juilliard. I'm happy that I went to Columbia for a doctorate. I'm happy to have the doctorate. I didn't think I would be happy to have a doctorate. Yeah. I didn't want to do that at all. Really? But um, for whatever reason, that's just how life happened for me. And I'm still in contact with some of these film composers. Yeah. Uh, and, I'm, and I actually want to get more of them on the mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. because I think it would be interesting to, to see uh, the film composers that are interested in concert music, I mean, because right. some of them are writing concert music. Right. Like James Dune Howard. Uh, I did a show with him, and he was. we wow. were talking about his violin and concerto and things like that. Wow. And uh, I just did one uh, with Bruce Broughton, which is up online mm -hmm. by now, uh, who did Silverado, and he did the main theme for the I Orville. love that movie, Silverado. You, you know this movie? I yeah. watched it over and over again. <laughs> yeah, he, I had him. He was sitting right there. Wow. <laughs> like... <laughs> recently and but he writes concert music he has yeah. a really terrific i should connect you there's a guy like named this. jack redford who lives lived near where i did live for years in pennsylvania who's like the orchestra he's like hollywood's orchestrator oh yeah and he, i had him do a workshop for our students he just he just finished the elemental the new pixar movie he's the orchestrator for the oh really the movie. and he like conducted the little mermaid like the, the disney movie like he's the conductor on that he's over on the east coast which he's on the east coast and just, he yeah. just he does it all from from here is that something that you wanted to do at some point nah. do the film stuff or <laughs> no i never really even thought about it there's so many jazz musicians yeah that can improvise well like uh, chris bowers yeah the, who graduated from juilliard with a jazz degree right. in piano he he does films <clears throat> and yeah that kind of thing and for whatever reason the, a lot of those jazz pianists yeah. they can they can write they can they can, write. they're fast <laughs> yeah yeah but i do think of like films i mean when i think about how i think about music i i think there's sort of like a just a dramatic pacing kind of 
connects to films in a way, you know, like creating this vibe and this mood and this atmosphere. And I mean, it's maybe that's like a, a no brainer, but I mean, just the pacing of the ideas, I guess when you're doing film music, obviously you have to hit the mark with the pacing of the film, obviously. Right. But I think it's, you know, creating the world, like doing a, a choral piece, like that, that sacred piece, you know, I'm going to cr- try to create a world where I really capture this poem that I love so much. It's a poem that the president of the seminary loved, a John Donne poem. And I'm a Christian composer, so I also love John Donne. So and I, ha- I had that poem, you know, circled in my book for years. Like, I would love to do this poem. And then they commissioned me to set that very poem, you know, that I had loved. So I'm trying to, I think of it as sort of like a film where I'm trying to hit the marks, you know, because the poet is, you know, broken, 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 then finally hopeful at the end. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want the music to, you know, to do that, I guess, the same way a film composer maybe would. Yeah, like text painting text or, you know, painting, like yeah. doing this kind of plot outline, narrative outline, Yeah, which um, I guess you can do with absolute music too. Right. I mean, you have, you know, the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. That's like probably yeah. the most famous example yeah. of that where yeah. you just make up a story. But when you have text, obviously you, yeah. you, you go, you go in on that. Yeah. You know, with, with this idea yeah i guess you could write write your own story and then write yeah. the music that would go with your story but with the <laughs> film of course you know you're it's not your story it's not your anything you're kind of like this uh person that usually comes at the end but if you're yeah. lucky you're involved in the beginning with yeah. the script and you can at least yeah get some ideas in the director's head yeah but you're, often it's not that way yeah you're definitely serving the serving the director yeah, yeah. obviously there is this kind of uh this kind of balancing act, right? Because, you know, the less control you have over, over something, usually the more, uh, the more income you get from it because, you know, they want you to do something, you're providing a service, but when it's the other way and you have the most control, yeah. right? Well, you have the control. Why would we have to pay you? <laughs> right. So that's kind of the, the problem I feel like in our, our little concert music world that, yeah. that we're facing all the time. It's like, well, we're letting you do whatever you want. Why should we, you know, why should we also pay you on top of that? Yeah, there are things. It almost feels like the, the performance is the pay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like we're going to play your piece. Yeah, for me, you know, it's just writing a piece for somebody who I'm really inspired to write for mm-hmm. is so rewarding. Like I have my teaching gig, so that's kind of like that's that's my nine to five. You know, that's, that's my it's job. It's a full time. It's a full time thing. Yeah. So I have you know, all the composing is sort of like super fulfilling sort of icing on you know on the cake because you know? i'm just as excited to write a piece for a giant ensemble as i am to write a piece for a solo oboe you know like a, you're probably the same way right I mean, you'll, you'll, yeah, you'll yeah. get into the oboe and you'll be like what can i do well like i if i'm writing an orchestra piece after orchestra piece you can't really say no first of all because right. you know you don't know when the next one will come right right i mean i'm not freaking john adams or yeah. or whoever like where i can just kind of write whatever i want i kind of have right. to take it so yeah, I will do it. Like after the LA Phil piece, I have another piece for orchestra. I got it right. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm gonna do it. But you know, I wrote a solo oboe piece recently. Actually, oh, really, it was it was great. It was fun because like what you're saying, you write for the player. Yeah. You know who's playing it. You can ask them a billion questions. Yeah. They're happy to answer. Yeah. Can't do that with an orchestra. Yeah. In fact, it's the opposite. You know, I I I, I ask a question, maybe I don't get a response right. for for weeks from the conductor or whoever. Oh really? And um, that's just the way it is. So what's it like for the rehearsal? Like how much time do you, do you get? Well, with this piece, the, cause I'm writing this piece, like you were mentioning it before we came down here, the piece yeah. with LA Phil, I, um, I spoke with the conductor and he was very, very nice, you know, and he was very upfront with how much rehearsal time I would get. He said somewhere in the neighborhood of two hours total in the right. week, including the dress rehearsal and all that. And to me, that was like, that was good, you know, Yeah. because I was afraid it was like half an hour, which right. I've heard stories from other wow. composers that work with big orchestras that they got like half an hour for their 10 minute piece. <sighs> I'm like, so did they even play through the whole thing? Because <laughs> like, I'm sure they had questions. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and like, no, I didn't even hear the whole thing until the show. Wow. Like, okay. That, and then it kind of changes how you write the piece. If So him telling me two hours for a 10 minute piece. Okay, yeah. I can relax a little bit i don't gotta worry about oh my yeah. god is this how much is this 30 second blip in the piece gonna take is it gonna take an hour of rehearsal yeah because if it if it's a good 30 seconds okay yeah. i'll be fine with the hour of rehearsal yeah. if the rest of it so but you don't have to deal with this yeah. this mind game writing for yeah. less players so that's kind of the, the joy yeah of that. there was a funny thing i i 
my first choral pieces I did were for the Greg Smith singers. And they were like Stravinsky's choir, like on all those, Stravinsky conducts Stravinsky. It's, it's the Greg Smith singers. And I'd never written a choral piece. And my teacher was Lucas Foss. And he had a history with the Greg, Greg Smith Singers. So I saw a thing in the American Composers Forum. The Greg Smith Singers are coming to Philadelphia. They'll, they'll do, a, I guess it was an hour. They gave you an hour for 250 bucks. They would say, read your piece for you. And it'd be like a first rehearsal of your piece. But so, what, what year was $250? So what year? This would be back in Ish. like around 2000. So it's like 500 in today's yeah. money, I suppose. U.S. Yeah. So then I was like man, how, how do I not do that? I'll, I'll, I'll go for that, you know? Yeah. So I, I sent them, Greg Smith, my piece, and then they didn't pick it. And then I, I think I called Lucas, and I was like, I'm so, so disappointed, you know, I didn't get chosen for this. And then about an hour later, like, Greg Smith's like, oh, we're going to do your piece too. <laughs> I'm like, oh, thank you, Lucas. Nice. I'm guessing that's what just happened. I mean, it seems like that's what happened. So they would, they would sight, read, you know, sight read your piece for you, and you would hear what that first rehearsal, you know, would sound like. But it is something to do with, like, at least you have some feedback. At least you have some, uh, at least you can hear the thing and not be in guessing land and about. Yeah, maybe it was that. Yeah, so, so they, would re they would rehearse your piece, and then it, he, he would maybe choose, you know, your piece to be on the concert, which he did with mine. So then, you know, you had that extra time with them. But the thing I'm doing now is, like, a piece for the National Flute Association, and so it's just flute and piano. And I've already had two sessions this week with amazing flutists, you know, on Zoom of them playing through it and then saying, you know, this is what the tongue pits will sound like if you do it mm -hmm. that way. If you do it this way, it'll sound like that. Um, so working one-on-one -on -one is just so great. I mean, it's amazing just to have somebody who is a real virtuoso who can just try everything out and give yeah. you all these options. Because especially with like string writing, I look at some people's string pieces, like yours. I'm like, how do they know all these things, you know, all these different kind of effects, and different types of harmonics, you know, when you have a player to work with, yeah, I don't. I don't know. Helpful. That's how. Oh, I don't, don't know. I, I, I ask them. I or yeah. I have a sound. I want to do. Um, I don't know what's an example. I was just. Uh, I was putting up this short earlier today of um, this piece I did a while ago where there's a double stop. Yeah. And my idea was okay. I want one of the pitches to be up a six tone and the other pitch to be yeah. the same pitch but down a six tone. Is it possible? I have no idea. Can they right. actually do it? What strings were they? play these two notes yeah. on. So I got to ask them before I do yeah. it. And then if I want to do a chord after that, is it possible? Can you move right. your fingers up slightly or is it not possible in that right. position? Right. Okay. If it's not possible in that position, what position is it possible in? Like which notes can I use? So yeah, I, I'm not going to bullshit. I don't know. And you know, I don't play the violin. So how would I know? You know, right. and the Adler orchestration book, Yeah. God bless him. I, he used to be my teacher a while back, but you know, that book doesn't have all those yeah things in there it's not really designed for that kind of writing yeah and there, there's some really good books like the oboe piece i wrote there's a book called oboe unbound and it's oh just, yes i know this book it's a good uh, book I mean, it's, it's, clive i think van, her name libby libby van libby, libby van cleave or cleave. something yes. i think that's right yeah but she has a website and she has all of her all the examples so you can look at see what it looks like hear what it sounds like and then i gave it to the oboes and he's like oh i have a different type of oboe so that's not going to work on my mm -hmm. oboe but I can do this instead. Like, oh, okay, that, that sounds great too. Um, I have a bass clarinet book that actually has some of my music as repertoire, which is the, the Harry Sparnay's book. Oh yes, I know this book too. Yeah, and that I'm comes, gonna put all this stuff down because we're just kind of naming yeah. things because we know these things. But I'm gonna put this stuff down: the, yeah. the bass clarinet link the bass and the oboe unbound link. Is there a same, those two. Is there such a thing for flute and bassoon? Like, I don't know if there is. It probably there is. There is one for bassoon. It, the the website is kind of antiquated a little bit but i i've i've tried to use it but i couldn't figure out they had multiphonics and things like this there's a great dissertation that i saw online uh with fingerings i don't know if it's public what was the other instrument you said flute i mean or flute any... has a lot of resources online yeah. yeah i can't think of one that i use i usually have a bunch of tabs open equally yeah i haven't seen a book where there probably is a book yeah but there's definitely some websites that i go to oh yeah regularly absolutely to check out but you have like this great list of um uh, you have this playlist where you have all these solo woodwind instruments yeah which is uh, really inspiring to me because i'm kind of doing a, a similar sort of thing now with my solo like yeah. sequenza series, I call it my my Barrio sequenza. Are you series. doing? You're writing one for each. Yeah, yeah. I have four. Wow. I don't have as many as you do, <laughs> but uh, you have a you have like at least a dozen or something like. Yeah, this. I guess so. 
Uh, and usually I find that the, the more rare the instrument, the more people want to play wanna that. Do like it. I have a contra, contra bass clarinet piece um, called Bottom Feeders, and people are always you know, asking for that one because it's there's hardly any. If you go online and just look up on YouTube, contra bass clarinet sheet music, there's not very many there's options. Not much stuff. But I wrote a solo violin piece. Like nobody's ever asked for it. <laughs> right? Because why would they play that? They couldn't do the box. Like you know, nobody's ever inquired times. of that piece. Well, um, let's hear. Um, let's hear the one you wrote for alto flute because that yeah. one is a. That's a also kind of a rare instrument. Yeah. So here is a. Here's a couple minutes from that. <laughs> So I found writing those solo pieces to be really great for me because people can obviously just play them at home. You don't have to pay for rehearsals. People want repertoire if it's for a rare instrument. Um, so I definitely recommend to the composers to connect with the instruments that don't have a lot of repertoire because it's, you know, those are the ones that I'm always getting asked about. Um, so I've written a bunch for alto flute and connecting with a player like Carla Rees who just played that piece. It was called Carla for her. You know, she's a great person to know because she has her own publishing company. She publishes them. She plays them, you know, quite a lot. Um, so, you know, alto flute. I did a piece for bass flute, um, you know, bass clarinet, contra bass clarinet, a lot of the low, lower instruments, it seems. I don't have a piccolo piece. or um, I have, of course, solo flute. I have a solo oboe piece that somebody's getting ready to record for me. I don't have a solo clarinet piece. I have a bassoon piece. But again, like what you said before, you know, with the solo violin, it's like right. there's a lot of solo clarinet. They could play the Stravinsky three yeah, pieces. Exactly. You know, and and that's probably the only like why would they need to play something else? Almost. It's right. like it's yeah. kind of of course they should be playing other things, but yeah. this is kind of the problem that we are we're facing, you know, yeah. as composers um, that have a limited time on this earth, right? Right. We have a limited amount of time to to write number one and then the second part to be known yeah and all these composers that are getting played a billion times now like many of them were not that as famous as they are now right but who the heck cares about that you know yeah who cares about uh, having your stuff played after you're gone it's so i think philip glass said something like this i don't remember but um he like he didn't care after he was gone if his stuff ever got played which is right. kind of my mentality yeah <laughs> yeah it's just for the thrill of it's so exciting and rewarding to have something played. Yeah. And, and it's the opposite if it's like, you know, not well played. You know? Right. It's like, how fast can I get on the other side of the planet from where I am right now? <laughs> like I, I wrote a, well, I shouldn't say that one. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I don't want the person to some, someday stumble on this video, <laughs> you know. Um, Probably won't. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's just such a thrill, you know, to have, it's so rewarding and enjoyable to have something played well. And it's, that's the reward, you know, for me. I love it when I'm, when I get a nice, you know, commission that's going to be, a lot of people are going to hear it or whatever, like at a convention or whatever. Mm -hmm. But also, in the fall, I wrote a 45-minute piano piece. Jesus Just because I felt, I just wanted to. I was inspired to write a set of piano preludes because I hadn't written for piano in over, you know, over a decade probably. And I'm a pianist, and I missed writing for piano. But nobody ever asked for my piano music, you know. Especially piano pieces that long. Yeah, it's just totally impractical set of preludes. But I, it was just, I was inspired. And I, the Messian has, he has those 
that two hour piano piece to 20 regards, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I wanted to go longer than an hour, but I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. <laughs> yeah. With the Morin Feldman, there's the Morin Feldman yeah. stuff. And um, I think um, uh, Jörg Frey has something like this. It's a huge uh, yeah. piece, kind of in the Morin Feldman yeah. style. You know, Michael Hirsch? Yes, yes. He just had that yes. thing at Sawdust that was like eight hours long or something. Oh, yeah. Or he's, 12 uh, he's, hours. One, he's a monster pianist, too. He is. Yeah. Yes. Over at uh, Peabody's, at Peabody's yeah. still, right? He was, I was at Peabody as a student with him, and he was a student. Oh, wow. We were in the same class. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. But he was uh, he was more like romantic, late romantic kind of music at that point. And then after we both kind of parted ways, and I would kind of catch up with what he was doing, and it was in his voice now. It's like really amazing. But what is it like? I mean, I mean I'm starting to see now, like I'm a, you know, just finished – with all school, I can't go to any more school. That's <laughs> kind of capped, right? Unless yeah. I do a different degree altogether. But what was, how, what's it like the last 20 years, 25 years, whatever number it is, like seeing all these, like you see Michael Hirsch, for example, you know, go on to Peabody, still composing, still teaching. But mm -hmm. what has it like been for you? Because I'm sure, you know, you, I mean, you went on to do, you know, just still be active in the field. And I'm sure you know people that are not active in the field anymore. Right. What, I mean, what has that been like uh, growing up? Because I feel like it's different for people mm. that go to law school or people that go to med school or because, you know, you graduate from med school, they're all going to become doctors. Right. You know, they're none of them are going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. Right. I'm going to go into accounting like they, but with our field, it's not like this. I saw some statistic a while ago, like from the nineties, the New York times from the Juilliard school. It was like, it was crazy. It was like 20% of all Juilliard graduates. Yeah. are still in music after yeah. 10 years after they graduate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the people who really love it are going to find a way to do it, you know. That's what I think, even if it's just doing... Like, when I graduated from undergrad, I started teaching piano lessons. That was in 91. Like, I still teach piano lessons. Really? <laughs> I still teach piano lessons wow. to, to, like, third graders. That's separate from the mm -hmm. university? I mean, I was doing it up until the pandemic, and then I said okay well we can't meet anymore so if you want to do it on zoom i'll do it on zoom and then they said yeah we want to keep going with you so so it, it still goes on i don't make any effort to contact people to, to take lessons you know but if you want to take lessons all right we'll keep doing it so you can find a way to to do music if you're like a lifer you're like i, mm -hmm. I, I need to, there's nothing else i can do you know the, the world is changing so much though so like the students who we have now i feel like they're going to find a way to do their thing and the broader the base of stuff they, they have, you know, probably the better, you know. So there's all these music business things and entrepreneurship and all the technology stuff and that they can also be doing while they're studying composition or doing film work or teaching, teaching an instrument, you know, being a church musician, directing church thing or being a high school teacher, you know. You kind of find find your way if it's if there's nothing else, you know. That you can do you imagine. find that like the people that you were in school with you that don't do music anymore do you still catch up with them and do they seem like happier that they did something else i don't i can't really think of that many people who who are in that category because they all they're all kind of doing something yeah of course you're doing music. something i'm just trying to think of like the people that i graduated with who aren't i can't really think of any right now who aren't somehow still like music people you know in mm -hmm. one way or another um they all found some way to to keep doing some it. way to keep it going yeah. yeah. No, I'm just I'm just mentioning that because of the Juilliard statistic. Yeah. I thought that was so crazy. I yeah. couldn't believe it. And uh, yeah. and I found this out before I went to Juilliard. I'm like, oh my god, I know this. Yeah. I have the statistics in front of me. Why am I gonna go uh, there and pay a hundred grand to go to go here if this is the statistic? Yeah. And talk. <laughs> yeah. But I remember being at Peabody and and the in the seminar and the teacher saying, "So what are you all gonna do after you graduate?" <laughs> like that was a conversation for the entire you know student composition student group and we're all like oh i don't know you know but at that point i was already giving lessons and i was playing jazz gigs every weekend so i was already living as a musician like i was the older student who came back and i was like super gung-ho you know because i was like i'm going to grad school at peabody you know like i'm gonna try so hard and i'm gonna be like the best straight a student you know yeah so and i was in fact i i, I so much liked what i was doing in pennsylvania that i just drove twice a week down to baltimore i drove two hours spent all day there on yeah, Tuesday, uh, yeah. drove back Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday. I just did this long commute. So I wouldn't have to give up all the fun gigs I was doing and the lessons I was doing. And in stuff. Baltimore. Yeah. Wow. I was, and I, I used it, this is the days of cassettes. I had cassettes, you know, I would play in my car. 
so I would just listen to the Berlioz Requiem up and back, or I'd listen to some Miles Davis. You know, I, I, it was like a listening class. You know, I just cranked up some music, got my decaf, and <laughs> turned out. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I mean. This is the first time I ever we've ever met, and yeah. that's what I'm. That's the vibe I'm getting from you that you really love yeah. what you're doing, and that's that's what carried you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Through it. I mean, it's, it sounds like really simplistic, but I'm I'm getting the more people I talk to on this thing, that's the general sense that I'm getting like yeah that's really all that you need to, to and then you'll find the things that are good for yeah. you because not everybody can do this or do that or right you know I don't think you you need to like change what you're doing to try to match this is the hip thing now you know I think you you do the thing that you love and you try to put the community around you of the people who are kind of in that world that that you're in I mean Lucas Foss said to me if you're trying to be current you're already too late mm. because it's already People have already moved on past that. So, the younger people coming up now, they're gonna they're gonna find a way to do their thing one way or another if that's what they love. And for me, if I don't compose, you can ask my wife. You know, I, I'm like, <laughs> sweetie, I need to go compose. <laughs> you know? Like, You're I need irritable, I, right? I need to find time each day to, for my I call yeah. it my creative time. Might be working on a YouTube video or something too. Might be like I need to edit that video. Right? But, yeah, anything that's. I'm doing something. Something, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like my dad yeah. used to go into the, his workshop and he would make, you know, shelves for us and CD cases and stuff, you know, because, and he got pleasure out of creating something with his hands. Maybe it connects to that, that, that whole creativity thing. Or like God the creator, you know, created the universe and there's something connecting there. Like a, a creating is enjoyable. So if I don't do that, I'm not, you know, I, I miss it. Yeah. I'm not horribly unhappy, but I'm like, I miss, I miss composing. You know? I get irritable. You yeah. don't want to be around me <laughs> if I haven't been composing. I think I could not, com I don't know how long, how the longest time you've been without composing, but you know, I've gone on a month, two months without composing. You know, that's sometimes that could happen, but I'm not a happy camper. And I don't, and sometimes I don't even know why, like, why am yeah. I not feeling good? Like, yeah. I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm eating well I'm I'm sleeping well, but why do I, why do yeah. I feel irritable? And then I realize, wait, I, I haven't written in a while, and that's why now I have a little journal. I would actually log in when I write, really, because it's almost like you know when you you know how sometimes you know you go to the gym. Some people are very serious about it. They log in when they go. Yeah, I think it's the same kind of thing. If you stop logging in and you forget, well, when was the last time I did that uh, at that activity? And then you can't remember. Was it a week? Was it two weeks? Was it a month? Right. And then you start feeling down, and yeah, and that's why I log things in now yeah. with the composing, because then that's I know great. okay. I did 90 minutes two days ago. Yeah. You know, maybe it's time to do another 90 today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I never went, I don't think I've ever gone two weeks without composing. Like I would, I would really not be happy. Um, but I have this, another list of things that I make my students read are all these quotes from Tchaikovsky and Shostakovich and Billy Joel and Sting and Morton Feldman. And they're, they're all saying, basically, you got to sit down and like, put in your hours and they're saying every day you know you need to get there every day and just see if any fish are biting I remember my first lesson at Peabody the teacher said this week just see what kind of fish are biting and I'm like oh okay <laughs> and it was cool. like you're at a conservatory so pick any instruments you want and just write whatever That's you know cool. and then I would graduate from Peabody and I'd be like I haven't written an orchestra piece in all. I think I'll write an orchestra piece, like with no venue for it you know like it would just just to do it I'm gonna write a piece for tenor harp English horn, you know, just pick some instruments at random and just write whatever. And it was fun. But a lot of those are like, you know, early pieces that never saw the light of day, you know? Yeah, but you had a curiosity. Yeah. And there's that curiosity. And yeah. I think that's the point that curiosity has to keep going. Yeah. I like the idea of what you're doing is writing for each instrument and just exploring every instrument for all that it can do. You have a really cool piece for saxophone, too, where you're using multiphonics, but you're yeah. using them as a structural part of the piece. Not yeah. I use multiphonics in my bass clarinet stuff as a special moment of a surprise. Yeah, I but think you in that piece... The bass clarinet piece is the moment where you hit a high yeah. A or something, and then yeah. it kind of becomes the multiphonic. Yeah, but you have a you had a really cool way of structuring a whole piece around the thing, you know, the yeah. the event. Well, that I mean, that's the saxophone sonata. But that again, it came back to what we were talking about earlier, how I don't know anything. <laughs> right. So I asked the player Stephen Banks. I said, "Can you can you give me a bunch of multiphonics that sound like something?" And what I mean by sound like something. Actually, I think I was more specific. I said, can you make it sound like dyads? Can I right. get two notes? Right. Give me two notes per, and I can really hear them. And can I have notes that are not like a minor second? Like notes that maybe sound like a third or a seventh or a sixth, like something where I yeah. can really build a 
a sonority out of it. Yeah. And he gave me five or six of them that he liked. And then I chose two of them. And then that first movement that you're talking about, it just seesaws back and forth. And then yeah. all the notes around it are based yeah. on those. And it was kind of simple structurally yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, after he gave me those two chords. But if yeah. he didn't give me those chords, I would have been fish out of water. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, we had the Prism saxophone quartet do some things with our students and um, they demonstrated some multiphonics and like, this is a surefire multiphonic and they played it and it was like, oh, I got to remember that one, you know, so yeah. I wrote that one down. And they have a, a packet too they gave the students. It just kind of had some practical things in there. But yeah, I too, I just love to have a player just show me this stuff and then just kind of try to put put a piece together with what, you know, with what those sounds are, kind of write a piece around those sounds. I mean, you're definitely like preach the stuff you're preaching. You're definitely doing them a lot actively, mm. yeah. which I also appreciate, you know, because sometimes a teacher would tell you something. It's like, well, I don't, I don't see you doing what you just told me. Sometimes that happens, but of course you don't say it, yeah. it out loud, but uh, it seems like you're literally doing what you're saying. So yeah. that's, that's really cool to see. Yeah, I mean, I remember my lessons with Lucas Falls. He was like my favorite living composer. Like, I loved his music. And I just reached out to him, and I'm like, could I ever take a lesson with you? And we ended up becoming kind of like friends, you know, for the last 10 years of his life. But he would look at some of my music and be like, this is kind of a weird, weird ending. Like, it's a, it's a weird ending. <laughs> weird. It's kind of weird. Why did you end it like that? And I'd be like, but you write all kinds of weird stuff, man. I heard your stuff in the 70s. It was so weird. Yeah, what <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but then when I go back and look at it, I'm like, yeah, I see what he meant. I mean, he was trying to get me to be, I was writing for The Voice. It's not very graceful on, on The Voice, what you're writing right there, you know, trying to make it fit, be more idiomatic. Well, I mean, voice is a completely different thing. We yeah. can go on and on about this, but I appreciate you being here. Because yeah. if we start talking about the voice, that's another yeah. two hours for me. Right. Here. But uh, I appreciate you being on. Check out all the links down in the description below. We're going to have a lot of links for this one because I think we had like four excerpts and uh, oh, cool. some of these, uh, the books that we were mentioning. So I'll put those all down. And thanks again for coming. My pleasure. Yeah, there you have it.